Mark Albert, my colleague, my friend, has been writing about machining for Modern Machine Shop magazine for 39 years. He is retiring from a full-time role with the magazine. He and I recently sat down to talk about manufacturing technology, what he's seen, what he's learned in his years covering it. By the time you retire, I believe you will have put in 39 years with Modern Machine Shop? Yeah. You came in and what was, what was going on? What was the technology topic that was current when you joined? You know, the biggest topic in the background was productivity. And at the time, productivity was not the, like the everyday household concept it is today. The way we talk about like OEE and digital connectivity today is the way people were talking about productivity because I think well, in the 19, early 1980s when I started, um, a lot of shops and plants hadn't really been thinking about what the ratio of their you know, labor input and, and, and productive output was because they hadn't really needed to. They were still running and operating their uh, companies and manufacturing operations the way they had maybe since the end of the Second World War. Okay, productivity. I want to engage on that because I never realized that. I never realized that was a term that at some point people had to get their heads around. The, the implication of what you're saying is that letting some productive capacity just go to waste is part of the air that all of these shops breathe. You know, I, I don't think that was the case so much, Pete, is that they were making money. They didn't need to think about productivity. There was plenty of business to go around. Um, shops were busy. Uh, manufacturing was growing. Growth hadn't really slowed down. I guess it was starting to slow down and that's why people started thinking about it. So then they started looking at, well, what do we do about this? But before that could happen, just an awareness that we got to think about how productive do we need to be and what are we going to do to increase productivity was just starting to come to the fore then. Um, it seems strange now, but that's just the way it was. You did enter this industry right about at that moment where that, that unbroken growth curve since World War II, the, you, the, we had crested on that. And, and there was a period of, of manufacturing that was behind us and going to stay behind us in a different reality we had to adapt to. And, and you came in at the beginning of that. What was happening in a lot of shops, too, is they started to realize that new ways of machining parts were going to change the whole productivity equation. They're going to have to get on, on top of that. But I think for so long, they hadn't really needed to do that. New ways of machining parts. Y yes, ma I'm mainly numerical control, okay. computer numerical control. Okay, so let's talk about numerical control, NC. Um, Modern Machine Shop kind of found its voice with its commitment to NC technology and, and covering this. Does that sound right to you? Yes, it does. The editor at the time, Ken Gettleman, saw NC as the future of both machining and manufacturing. I mean, he was on a campaign to get information about NC in the magazine as often as he could. And there were a lot of people said, no, 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 NC's for big shops or for aerospace, all these complicated work. And he said, no, it's, it's for all sh machining shops. And because he wrote about it so often and so consistently, a lot of smaller companies and job shops started taking it seriously. And they looked to Modern Machine Shop as the source of a steady stream of generally very reliable and timely information about this whole technology. An another technology came, electrical discharge machining. Uh, you have given a lot of the attention, of your editorial attention over the years uh, to covering EDM. Uh, you were one of the earliest editors, it seems to me, to develop a knowledge base and a level of mastery about what EDM was, what it represented, what it could be. Was that your conscious attempt to try to stake out a place for yourself in terms of technology? Did you think about EDM as your NC? You know, I, I think what got me interested in EDM is that at the time, EDM was a little bit mysterious and misunderstood. Let me explain a little bit what, what electrical discharge machining is and how it works. I mean, basically, and very unlike uh, 
traditional machining processes where you have a, a, a cutting tool. Uh, the, the cutting tool is actually some kind of electrode and it was energized. So uh, some kind of pulsating electrical current was introduced into this electrode and that would cause sparks or discharges to jump to the surface of the workpiece. And each one of those sparks created a uh, very intense, high re, hi, highly localized and concentrated source of heat. And that literally boiled away a microscopic bit of metal. But it was clear that it was a, a better way of removing very hard materials um, than traditional processes, that, say, where you had to you know, slice up a mold or die so you could get a cutting tool in there. You could l literally erode a cavity if you were talking about you know the the sinker type of EDM and they called it sinker because it was initially used to sink cavities and dyes and molds. Um, at the same time there's also this other type of EDM wire EDM where the energized wire as it uh, traveled from reel to reel and passed through a, a workpiece could literally slice, slice through the, the material. So there were some opportunities to explain how this process worked and how it was being applied. And that just didn't, that really intrigued me. I was interested in trying to get behind that technology from my own understanding. And I found it very interesting and, and, and fascinating. And that was really what motivated me to write about EDM as often as I had the opportunity. Has the latest manufacturing technology always felt cutting edge. Is it always true that in the current moment the latest technology feels like a cutting edge thing or are there different seasons of that in which the technology feels more high tech? I don't think the most significant technology is even perceived sometimes as leading edge technology. And I can think of one example right now like machine monitoring systems for example I think are, are really important but I, we don't probably see those as some kind of leading edge technology, it's just a very practical way of getting information that we always wanted to have to make better decisions about our shop floor operations. But then when you look at a process where the machine has a different shape or a different size, uh, or it's got something unfamiliar like uh, some uh, automation, a, a, a pallet changer or a robotic um, part loading and unloading, um, that just feels and looks different. So we tend to see that as somehow like more the, the leading edge and so therefore we got to think hard about how we we make the most of this. It's, it seems to me what I hear you saying is we tend to focus on advances in technology categories we understand and underappreciate the things we don't have boxes for or definitions for that appear alongside that. Can you think of a technology advance that snuck up on us over the course of your career? Prove very impactful, but it wasn't recognized as that when it first appeared. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe high-speed machining, but it, f it feels like that's been creeping up on us forever, and we're, you know, there are still a lot of applications for it where it isn't being used where it should be because it's so difficult to bring all the things together that you, re you really need to make high-speed machining successful and, and effective. It was kind of the, the, the stealth end, see, if you will, in the sense yeah. that it really, you know, we don't machine the parts the way now, the way we did then. And if you look back at what's changed, a lot of those advances were associated with concepts behind high-speed machining. The transformation that machining has gone through may have a lot of its roots in things that were part of the high-speed machining package of technologies. You know, there were so many things you had to do to make high-speed machining work that we ended up doing it piecemeal, but we ended up doing it. NC was largely the programmed automation of the types of machining we were doing manually anyway. And I think what I'm hearing you saying is high-speed machining was the first framework we found for this very transformational thing, which was using NC in order to do a kind of machining that could never have been done manually because it relied on 
um, pr very precise servo control at high feed rates and uh, CAD CAM technology for, for programming very intricate moves. And so, uh, yeah, maybe there was a threshold cross there where this, this took us to the, the next place beyond what NC did. Okay, I, I, I think if you look at how efficient machining is in terms of how it's changed the amount of secondary work we have to do. And most of that's gone away, and a lot, you know, so because we can produce surfaces that are so close to the um, model dimension and the surface quality, and uh, that that's where we see the revolution. Okay, so um, you know when you think about some of the advances in cutting tools right now, uh, they're all designed to not necessarily take away chunks of material, although we are seeing advances in roughing techniques, but just being able to eliminate uh, a lot of scallops on a surface so that we much more efficiently get to the final shape and surface finish we want. We're, we're getting, we're, we're pretty much there. And I think a lot of that can be traced back to things that we learned when we started looking at high-speed machining. High-speed machining was really, in retrospect, not really about the speed. Yeah, you know, the, the challenge was getting everything right. And a, a bunch of things, not just the right cutting tool, but the right cutting tool, the right speeds and feeds, the right programming moves, um, you know, a lot of things. And it was almost as, more, as much a management challenge as it was a technical challenge, you know, getting everybody to do their part so that all these things came together. But when they did, the productivity games are really dramatic. Is there a technology you've written about that seemed really promising for which that promise hasn't been realized yet? Uh, um, yeah. Um, going back to when I first started with the magazine, um, one of the big issues was post-processors. So when you had the, um, the CL data, the cutter line data generated by the app, processor and app was, you know, automatically programmed tools. That was one of the first really practical and powerful programming software we had. It had to be post-processed to format it for a particular control on a particular machine, which meant that program wasn't very usable on any other machine with a different kind of control or a different machine with the same control. Um, so the technology for making exchangeable programs was developed in one way or the other over the years. And every time some of these came out, oh, this is gonna be a, finally solve this big problem of exchangeability of, or incompatibility of NC programs. And we've gone through several misfires with that. I mean, um, there was binary cutter location, BCL, and that was, I think, a workable solution, but it wasn't adopted, you know, partly because control technology uh, surpassed the, ba the value that BCL was able to offer. Then we started looking at step NC, and that was another thing that looked like, oh, we're not gonna do G-code programming anymore. Don't need post-processors. We're gonna actually generate the, uh, the processing of the geometry right in the control game, and that hasn't taken off. So yeah, there's been some things that look really promising that kind of fizzled on us. And I think any one of those, we could have said, oh, uh, this is the next big thing, but we were wrong, not because the technology didn't have the potential, the promise, just because other things uh, either overtook us or distracted us, took our focus away to something else. What technology are you interested in today? Well, uh, clearly this whole aspect of data-driven manufacturing. You know, a whole bunch of buzzwords floating around right now. Industry 4.0, the internet, industrial internet of things, um, digitalization. Um, I still like data-driven manufacturing is kind of the umbrella term for all that stuff. And I think that's, that is going to be really transformational or disruptive, if you will. Um, but it's not going to be an overnight thing either. You know, we're going to see this technology, I'm going to say, creep into how shops uh, do business or how they run their operations. It's probably going to happen faster than uh, we've seen some other technology take hold. Um, but like a lot of other technology, it's going to be implemented by shops buying things. 
they're going to go out and acquire a, sh a machine monitoring system or a um, tool management system, or they're going to look at the CAM system that's going to give them really well-developed application for developing a cutting tool library and integrating that in the programming process. And as developers and suppliers move ahead, shops will have more and more choices and the marketplace for actually implementing this technology. That's how we're going to do it. That's pretty much how we've, we've always done it. Whenever we talk about technology, I always remind myself that technology is another word for know-how. So ultimately it's about what people know and do. So uh, if we think of technology as all um, software or cutting tools or machine capability or whatever it is, actually it, it's, it's, it's a management issue. Uh, it's training. It's how people are going to learn and come to understand what can now be done with some of these tools. So I, I, when we talk about technology, I think you just can't get away from, well, what do people see? What do people need to know? How, how are they going to uh, adapt this for their needs? Because people are important to me. I, I like to see technology in terms of how people are dealing with it. You know, what are they, how does it feel to them? What does it look like? What changes have they made? What discoveries are they making when they're confronted with the opportunity to use technology or, or new developments in ways that haven't been uh, um, achieved before? That's exciting because it, it really shows us acting as creative, thoughtful people who are intent on you know, manufacturing as a way of making a better world for us.